If this is your first or second time here, I'd love to meet you in the lobby before you leave. My name is Jacqueline Snape, and I'm the executive pastor here at New Life Fellowship. Um, and so this is our last message in the Fruit of the Spirit series. Um, so we're almost in fall, as you know, not officially, but we're in fall almost. Football season has started. And so that means, yeah, yeah, that means Pastor Rich is back next Sunday. So make sure you come out. We want to have a real welcome for him. Um, we're going to hear about his sabbatical journey. Uh, he'll share with us and let us know what he believes that the Lord has done in him um, and anything that he wants to share with us at that time he'll do next Sunday. Okay? Um, so our, our sermon today is on patience. Um, again, this is our last topic, and it's called the topic... Um, the title of this sermon is Weathering the Storm, the Fruit of Patience. Um, so the, cha- the chapter that we're going to read today, if my mouth is going to work right, is Genesis 18, verses 9 through 14. But I want to set it up for you before I read. Um, in this passage, uh, Abraham is welcoming three messengers of God that were sent to him. Um, so we're going to join the conversation that he's having with them, beginning with verse 9. Here's the reading of the word. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your gifts to us, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and give our hearts receptivity that we can absorb and receive what you have for each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I have, um, I have a favorite childhood memory, um, and it involves this kind of quirky character. And so when the fall comes, it reminds me of this character. Um, and um, he not only was a, car- a comic book, uh, a cartoon character in the newspaper, so for those of you that are not as old as me, there was a time when there were print newspapers, and... <laughs> They had what was called a comic section. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it sounds so foreign, but it was a thing. And so we as kids, we would open up the comics and we'd read them. So he had, uh, he had a long stint in comics, and then they started releasing TV shows for this character. Now, he's not handsome. He's not smart. He's not even really interesting. He had a great dog, though. He had a great dog, and I'm talking about Charlie Brown. So I love Charlie Brown, and the thing was, there's nothing, we have nothing in common. Like, we literally have nothing in common. But what I loved about him is somehow it felt to me like he spoke to something inside of me as a kid. And I think over the years, he survived. He's still on TV. He's still, people are still watching the shows about him, still reading about him. And I think it's because in each of us, there is a little kid that in some way is kind of like Charlie Brown. So we're going to see a clip. This is one of the classic, classic Charlie Brown moments. All right? So dim the lights and let's see the clip. Charlie Brown, oh Charlie Brown. I can't believe it. She must think I'm the most stupid person alive. Come on, Charlie Brown. I'll hold the ball and you kick it. Hold it. Ha! You'll pull it away and I'll land flat on my back and kill myself. But Charlie Brown, it's Thanksgiving. What's that got to do with anything? Well, one of the greatest traditions we have is the Thanksgiving Day football game. And the biggest, most important tradition of all is the kicking off of the football. 
Is that right? Absolutely. Come on, Charlie Brown. It's a big honor for you. Well, if it's that important, a person should never turn down a big honor. Maybe I should do it. Besides, she wouldn't try to trick me on a traditional holiday. This time I'm gonna kick that football clear to the moon! Peculiar, Charlie Brown, how some traditions just slowly fade away. It never gets old, I'm telling you, it never gets old. This, what you saw, this poor my friend Charlie, he went through this about 40 times. About 40 times, and each time, the same result. He trusts Lucy, he goes up to the ball, she pulls the ball, he falls flat on his back, and she gives him that look. You know, she always had this look that she gave him when she would do something to him. So sometimes it's easier to describe something in terms of what it's not than what it is. This is not patience. Patience is not blind hope. It's not wishful thinking. And it doesn't require that we turn ourselves into doormats for other people to walk on. That's, right. That's not what patience is. Patience is a fruit of the spirit. It is a gift of God given to us so that it transforms us and gives us the ability to wait on God even when circumstances and our own agenda look like things are going downhill. Said another way, Patience is the ability to weather the storm. In our passage in Genesis, Abraham and Sarah, they are going through a massive, a massive storm. When we see them in the passage that we read, this is the culmination of what's happened before. And so several years before, the Lord had said to Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations, right? We've heard that story. And then there were revisits and that theme was continued to be reinforced that this thing was going to happen. And there was this massive, massive um, contribution that Abraham and Sarah were going to make to the kingdom. But in this, now in this encounter, now nothing's happened. In this encounter, the messenger comes back to say, it's going to be next year. It's coming. It's going to be next year. Next year, this child is going to be born, and this child's name is going to be Isaac. But the problem is we need to step back a little bit. Just step back and not think about this as a Bible story, but think about this as real life. In our story, Abraham is 99. His wife, Sarah, is 89. Now, you don't have to be um, you know, a rocket scientist to know those numbers don't add up. These people are preparing to die. Forget about having a child. They're preparing for their death. And so when the messenger comes in, and in that passage, when Sarah kind of laughs under her breath, I can resonate with that because who's believing that? Who's believing that? Are you believing it? I wouldn't believe it. It's been years and years and years. And in their culture, it's not just a, a sadness that they don't have children. It's a scandal. It is a scandal to be childless. So that meant Abraham went around when he first got this word from God. He's sharing this in the community. Everybody knows their family, their friends, here and wide. Everybody knows. And year one goes by. Year two. Year five. Year 10, nothing's happening. At this moment, I imagine they were just done. I mean, these are people, they committed their lives to God, gave up everything, everything to follow God. Can you imagine the depression, the feelings that they were going through? I think Sarah was, she probably laughed so that she didn't smack the messenger. She was probably... Fuming. So when you look at their journey, this is the thing that we need to connect with. And we need to realize that this is something that we can find ourselves in as well. What happens as, as individuals for us is when God, we believe, we've heard from God, we believe God has given us a word about something, we're pretty much sure this is what he has said. And how many of you know what it's like then to wait? 
and nothing happens. And you wait some more and nothing happens. And you know you felt like you heard God, but nothing happens. And sometimes what we begin to do in our impatience, we reach out and we grasp another solution, right? We grasp something else out. And the next thing that happens is it seems as though God comes out of nowhere with the solution, says, that wasn't what I had. This is what I've had for you. The reason I say it's something that we can relate to is because we've been doing it since he made man. That's what we did in the garden, right? Adam and Eve, we had the run of the garden, all good things. Everything was planned out. This everything you can have. But this one thing you can't have. And so as any parent of a two-year-old will tell you, what did we have to have? The one thing we couldn't have, we had to grasp. This is our journey. This is the human condition. In 2012, um, there was a study on patients done uh, by a magazine, in a journal called um, the Journal of Positive Psychology. And the goal was they're trying to find out where people find themselves in patients and how do you learn to increase your patients. So I thought it would be fun because things like this sound fun to me, that we would go through the questions and we would get to see how patient we all are. Now, you're not answering the questions and looking at your spouse or looking at your friends so you can later tell them, see, I told you you weren't patient. This is for you and you're gonna take the quiz for yourself, all right? So first, my friends would say that I'm a very patient friend. Sounds good, right? I'm able to wait out tough times. Although they are annoying, I don't get too upset when stuck in traffic jams. Okay, don't lie to yourself. Don't, don't. That's not you, okay? I'm patient with other people. I find it pretty easy to be patient with a difficult life situation, problem, or illness. In general, waiting in lines doesn't bother me. I have trouble being patient with my close friends and family. I get very annoyed at red lights. I find it easy to be patient with people. So I don't know about you, but when I look at this list, I'm not very encouraged about my patience level. I feel a little bit challenged. And for those of you who are over here on the exuberant side and you feel like, yes, that's me, the patient person, Ask somebody that's in relationship with you. I guarantee you, you're not hitting a home run on all those, okay? Ask somebody else what they think. I tend to measure my patience on good days. Everything's going well, you know, sun is shining, everything's happening the way I want it to happen, and then I feel like I'm a really, really patient person. But the truth and the reality is that our patience is formed in the difficult times the trials, the tribulations, those are the times that reveal for us where we are and where we live in this journey with patience. When my father died a couple of years ago, um, it was such an awful time for me. There were days that I felt like it was just hard to breathe. It was just difficult to breathe. I felt like I was in a hole and I didn't know how to get out of the hole, and the hole was just getting deeper and deeper. I was depressed. I just went through the days just mechanically, just getting things done, but there was this disconnect. Like, I wasn't really present, but I saw myself doing things. It was awful. And the odd thing about it was, years before, I had already lost my mother, and I thought at that time, okay, like, this is the worst it can get. Like, this is the worst but it was just, it got, it got worse. So it took me a while to come out of that. It took me a while to feel like I could even say I was normal again and I could enter into the world in any kind of a positive space. And I figured also that once I was done with that, I told myself, you know what? It's not gonna be this bad again. As bad as that was, like it's not gonna be this bad. And then, Out of the blue, a couple of weeks ago, um, my neighbor died under very tragic circumstances. 
I had known her about 10 years, and I was acquainted with her. We weren't best friends. She wasn't a family member. But all of a sudden, I began to feel those same feelings just rise up inside of me. The confusion, the disconnection, the feeling of being sinking into this hole, it just started coming up. And I was so confused because I said to myself, this is not a family member. This is not the same thing. Why is this happening? And then I felt like, okay, it's happening, but it's going to go. It's going to pass. This needs to stop because things just have to normalize. This is not, it doesn't need to be all that. I was so impatient with my own process. But then I realized, when I took another moment, I realized what happened was this was a trigger. And it triggered all of the sadness and all of the loss that was already inside of me. And it was bringing it all up to the surface and it was all commingling. And I was going into that deep dive. No matter how much I told myself, get over it, tell my logical mind, remember, this is not apparent, didn't matter. My body was still reacting as though it was going through that same circumstance. And the more I pushed to try to get myself to get it together, the more tired I became and the more of a weight I felt. And finally, finally, I had to realize that this is just going to take time. And I needed to have patience with me for me. Henry Nouwen puts it this way. He says, to learn patience is not to rebel against every hardship. So who do you need to have patience with? Is it a family member? Is it God? Are you wondering why something hasn't come to pass that you believe he spoke to you about? Is it yourself? Can you allow yourself to forgive yourself and have patience for yourself when you're looking at the consequences of your choices. After years of running and pain and suffering from his poor choices, King David sings about the patience of our God. And he says in Psalm 37, I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. It's easy to forget, it's easy to forget that our God is patience. He is the definition of patience. And when we tend and want to be impatient with ourselves, we have to remember that fact, that he is not impatient with us, regardless of how impatient we may be with ourselves. I'm a pretty big sports fan. Um, I'm not as much of a fanatic as my husband, but I am a pretty big sports fan. I've watched lots of team sports, lots of individual sports, you name it. There's not a sport I haven't watched at one time or another. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, I saw something that really was off the charts, something that I have never seen before, ever, in any sport, at any time. Uh, at the U.S. Open, two players, on the left, Naomi Osaka, 21 years old, and on the right, Coco Gauff, 15 years old, were in a match. Um, and Naomi, the 21-year-old on the left, Naomi won. And so at the end of the match, she, number one, this is shocker number one, she invited Coco into the winner's circle with her. Never happens. The winner's circle is where it's all about me, right? And I get my interview, and I talk about how great I did, and blah, blah, blah. She invited her into the winner's circle. And so Coco, first she says, no, no, I, I, I can't, because I'm just going to cry even more than I'm crying now. And so Osaka says to her, but you need to do it. You need to let people see how you feel. That's surprise number two. And so when they get into the winner's circle and Osaka begins to congratulate Coco, then she also looks to her parents in the stands and she speaks directly to the parents and she tells them what a great job they've done raising this girl, what a wonderful job they've done, how proud they should be as parents. You've seen that before? I've never seen that before. But there's one connection 
that wasn't even reported after all this was released. The thing is, there has been, there was a journey for Naomi, Naomi Osaka a year before this that no one has spoken about. And this is what she said in social media. She said, these have been the worst months of my life. The last few months have been really rough for me tennis-wise, but thankfully I'm surrounded by people I love and who love me back. Hopefully, she laughs. In that regard, I'm very thankful for them because whenever things go wrong, I blame myself 100%. I have a tendency to shut down because I don't want to burden anyone with my thoughts or problems, but they taught me to trust them and not take everything on by myself. The thing is, when we take, when we allow patience into our lives and we allow that fruit to transform us, we are able to give it out. We're able to show patience for others. We're able to see people as people. And that's what Naomi did. She saw Coco Goff, the person, not the tennis player, not the competitor. She saw her as a human being, and she saw this person needs something right now, and I have the ability, it's within my power, to give it to her. That's what opening yourself up to patience does. But the thing, we have to remember, patience it's not some work that we, we contrive of our own. It's not a personality thing. It's not something we can make happen. Remember, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a gift given to us by the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, we have to treat it as a gift, and we have to recognize there's certain things that we're going to need to do to cultivate this gift. Now, there are a lot of things that we could talk about this morning, but I'm going to zero in on three. And the first is that patience takes time. Abraham and Sarah truly did have a promise from God. It was real. We know it was real because we know that Abraham did become the father of many nations. We know that. We can see it now. But only God controls timing. Only he controls timing. He doesn't live bound by time. We live bound by time. For God, a day is a thousand years. So when he says to me something today, we have no idea when that's going to mature. That's only in the hands of our God. And we have to accept that. We can't control timing, but we have to submit ourselves to the one who does control it. The second thing is that patience takes perseverance. If we want to be a patient people, then we have to look at the one who is patience. We have to keep our eyes on the one who is patience. Patience is defined if you look at the church. Over 2,000 years ago, God created this thing. He created this movement, right? And look at all of the patience that he extended to us. Wars, other gods, moving away from him, coming back to him, killing, murdering, stealing, all through human history in the course of the church. Our God had the patience to allow us to find our way to him. He didn't have to do it. He had the ability to make whatever he wanted to happen, happen. Not even in the blink of an eye could he have made it happen. He could have just turned slightly and the world would have changed. But because of his infinite patience, we got to cooperate in this movement that we now call the Church of Jesus Christ. And he allowed us to make mistakes, to fall by the wayside, to make poor choices, it didn't deter his, his goal. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul said, but for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Because our God displayed patience, we can do it. And finally, patience takes trust. The thing about farming 
When we talk about crops and we talk about the fruit of the spirit, and remember Rosie shared with us a couple of weeks ago um, about how the farming process works. A farmer can have the right seed, a farmer can have the right soil, they can have the right environment because that's key where you're growing certain things. They can have all of that. But what they cannot control is one thing which can make or break everything. They cannot control rain. A farmer cannot control rain. Only God can control rain. And in our lives, there's lots that we can control. But one thing we can't control is when the rain, when the storms, when the trials, when the tribulations of life are going to come, we cannot control that. But what we can do is we can allow those things to soak into our hearts. And when we allow the tribulations that come through the trials and times of life to soak into our hearts, it gives us a heart of flesh. And it gives us the ability to have patience and wait on our God to deliver an answer for us. Patience softens our hearts. And patient people become patient people to others. When we are patient, we can be patient with those around us. But if we're not patient with ourselves, if we don't receive this fruit and allow it to blossom, allow it to grow in our lives, we will not have anything to offer the world. There's another great lesson in the story with Abraham and Sarah. Even though they're in the Bible and we talk about them all the time, the reality is they're not necessarily great examples of biblical patience. You know, Abraham had a lot of stumbles, okay? In a couple of chapters before the one that we talked about, he actually asked his wife to tell a group of men that she was not his wife, that she was his sister, because he didn't want the consequences of them knowing this was his wife. And Sarah, in order to alleviate, she thought, the pain of being childless, asked her husband to have sex with another woman so that they could have a child, because she thought that would make things better. And we see how that turned out, right? They weren't exactly biblical heroes in this area. But you know what? I think that's great. I'm glad. Because you know what they were? They were people. They were people. And maybe you haven't done one of the things they did, and maybe I haven't done those things, but we've done everything else. And so when God gives us this example of Abraham and Sarah, you know what it says to me? It says to me, he's saying, look, you are not going to be patient. You're going to be impatient. You're going to grasp. You're going to reach. You're going to go for the wrong thing. I'm going to have to redirect you. I'm going to have to show you what I have for you. But it's okay because my promises are not dependent on your patience. They're dependent on my patience. And he says for each and every one of you, you got to hear this. He said, I'm never impatient with you. I'm never impatient with you. I don't care how many mistakes you make. I don't care how many times you go on to plan B. I don't care how many times I have to pull you back from plan B and put you on plan A. I'm never impatient with you. And whatever God has spoken over your life, it will come to pass. Because he's not a God that he should lie God doesn't lie, and he doesn't have to repent, he doesn't have to change his mind, and he doesn't have to figure out what he's going to do next when you make a mistake. He is patient with you. Hear that word. He's patient with you. I don't care if your mom is not. I don't care if your dad is not. I don't care if your wife, your husband, your parents. I don't care who is not patient with you. You leave here knowing the God of the universe, the God of the universe, the God that created everything, he's still standing with you. And he's saying, I'm patient with you. I'm in it for the long haul. I am in it for the long haul with you. I'll never leave you. And I'm never going to forsake you. No matter what storms come, no matter what comes. Storms can be destructive. I am not minimizing. I don't know what any of you are going through. 
Some of you are going through some horrible storms. Some of you are going through some tragic things. And I'm not going to minimize that. It hurts. It hurts. But I want you to know that God is there with you. He's with you. He's in it. He's not going anywhere. And he doesn't run out of patience. A few weeks ago, when Hurricane Dorian was was first spotted in the Atlantic, you know, it was like this small storm. And they weren't really thinking too much of it in the initial stages. And it took about a week for that hurricane to turn to a Category 5. And when it sat on the Bahamas, no matter what we know, we think we know a lot as people, we think we know so much, no one knew, no one predicted that that storm would sit on that island for almost two days. No one still knows why. Why did it really happen? There are theories, but no one really knows why. No one knows why. And I know some of you right here feel like that's you. Like this thing has been sitting on me and it's not moving and I feel like it's destroying everything. But you have to know that God has placed himself in that storm with you. He's in it with you. He's reaching out his hand to you, and he's not going to leave you. And for some of you, you're sitting here saying at the same time, okay, I hear all this, um, but I can tell you I'm not a patient person, and I know that about myself, and uh, I've tried everything, and I still find myself impatient with my kids. I find myself impatient with coworkers. I just can't seem to master this. And for those of you that say that, I'll tell you, that's right. You can't. You're not going to master it. You're not going to do better tomorrow. Patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Only God himself is going to make you a patient person. You're not going to do it. Just like you didn't save yourself, you're not going to grow patience in yourself. But what you can do is you can be open, and you can be available, and you can be willing, and you can say, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. I have no idea. I'm a mess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But remember what the messenger said to Abraham. He said, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? So whatever you think about yourself, whatever you think can't be done, whatever you think can't happen, the cross says, you're wrong. You're wrong. There's nothing too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing, no thing is too hard for God. All you need is to be open. All you need is to give him opportunity. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and we're going to pray. So, Father, we thank you for, we thank you for the fruit that you have deposited in each and every one of us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your promises to us. We thank you, God, that we don't have to perform. We don't have to get things right. We don't have to be perfect. We can just be open. God, help us to learn to have patience with ourselves, with you, as you do this work in our lives, trusting trusting and knowing that you're doing it even right now right now you're doing the work that we can be a blessing to those around us and we can show the world what our God is capable of in Jesus name amen Amen. please stand
trust in you. Oh, yes, I will trust. teams to come to my left, to your right, and um, those that are hosting communion, to my right and to your left. Um, God, 
is patient with you. And he's not going to forget you. He's not going to forget you. He doesn't promise us it's going to be an easy life. That's not the promise. There are lots of ups and downs. If you've been living for more than a day, you realize that. It's not easy. It's not easy. But one of the things that we need to remember as well is that we are the body of Christ. We're a community of people. We're not the singular pieces of some random puzzle. He calls us a body for a reason. And so after this service, there's a small group connection. We don't, look, it's, it's not, we're not having small group connection because this is what we do, and so we just do that because that's what we do. We have small group connection because we recognize Sunday service, although it's wonderful, we love it, we enjoy it, and it, this is the time for us to worship together, celebrate together, but on a weekly basis, you need connection. You need a community. You need people that you sit with that know you and you know them, and they can encourage you when it comes, when the storms come, because they're coming. If you're not in one now, you know what they say. It's around the corner. When I went through this a couple of weeks ago, that Saturday, it just so happened I was coming to church. And I got to talk to people that I know well here. And they got to encourage me. And they prayed for me. And it helped me. It really, really helped me. Don't overlook community. You are not too busy. You're not too busy to be in community. Get that out of your head. You're not too busy. Community is God's gift to you. It's his gift to you. So after service, go downstairs, see what's available. If there's not something that you think is fitting for you, maybe you can start something. Maybe you can invite a couple of friends and you can start a different kind of group. The other thing, this fall, um, in October, we have a, um, a day alone with God, a congregational day alone with God. And we do this because we, re we realize it's going to be, it's really easy to say, okay, I'll just push off having more time with God. I'll push it off. I'll push it off. It'll come next month. It'll come six months from now. So we set these days aside so that you can set aside real time to have with God. Real time. You can sit in that space. If you don't want to, you don't want to interact with other people, if that's not what you feel you need, you just need to be with God, you can do that. But you can also have the blessing of while you're doing that, be in community with others and help each other. What is God saying? What am I hearing? How is it impacting me? What do I need in this season of my life? Preparation is an important thing. Only God controls the timing of the storms, when they're coming. He's the only one that can do that. But we can prepare ourselves so that we have hearts that are open to patience as he sees us through the trials. So I'm going to ask you to hold out your hands. I'm going to pronounce a blessing over us, and then please come for prayer or come for communion as well. Brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, I pray that his face would shine down upon you today and that as you look in the eyes of your Savior, you see the fruit, you see joy, you see peace, you see kindness, you see all of the fruit looking back at you. And you also hear his patient and loving spirit toward you. I pray that you can receive it, take it into your soul, and let it be nourishing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>